about when I was 15 years old, and I had just gotten my first summer job. Now, I was really excited because I was going to be working as a tutor in a neighboring school district. And I was excited because where I went to school, there was only a handful of people that looked like me. But in this neighboring school district, the majority of the students were brown. And this was very exciting to me because I was in this place where I was really trying to figure out where I belonged, what group I fit in. And it was a continuous struggle for me. So I got to the first day of orientation and I was a little disappointed because it was very clear that friendship groups had already been established. Now, whether it's because these people all worked there the previous year or they all went to the same school, um, I wasn't sure, but it was clear that I was kind of the odd man out. But I'm a very good student, so I started to take notes. It was clear they had like a vernacular of their friend groups, a way of speaking and communicating with one another, and that was not how I spoke. So, I took notes. And then I would go home every night and I would practice. Like, I would practice the nuances, uh, the subtleties of the way they would say things. The other thing I observed is they had a very cool way of dressing. I didn't dress cool. As a matter of fact, my father had never purchased me a single name brand item. But now that I was making my own money, I could dress cool too. So I took my very first paycheck, I went to the mall, and I got some really great outfits, and week two, I showed up dressed from head to toe. There was a group of students that were talking, and I decided to just kind of weasel my way into the conversation. They were talking about the events of their weekend, and I just kind of said in a ridiculous way, Oh, yeah, 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 see, I went to the mall this weekend, and I got these outfits, and they was the bomb, and then I went to this party, and I was getting jiggy with it with this dude who was trying to holla, holla. <laughs> and there was this awkward silence, followed by a huge uproar of laughter. And the laughter wasn't only within uh, the circle that I was in, it was like a wave and kind of moved out to the rest of the room. It was like one of those movies where all of a sudden everything goes into slow motion and people are laughing and pointing. I wanted to crawl into a dark hole. I remember there was one guy whose voice I remember hearing saying, certain people shouldn't say certain things. Well, the truth of the matter is he was right. Because I wasn't speaking from my soul. I wasn't speaking my language. I was trying to be someone that I wasn't. I was at this period in my life where I often felt like I was too white acting for the black kids and too black for the white kids. But I realized in that moment that I didn't have to work so hard to be black, because I already was. That was established for me. What I did need to figure out, however, is what else I was, in addition to that. So I spent the rest of that summer reading self-help books. I would go on the internet and browse, like how do you really find yourself? And I kept coming across um, all of these um, sayings that really you need to focus on what you love. What do you love? Not like, not strong like, love. To the point where even if you were utterly exhausted, you would want to continue doing that activity. Well, for me, that was singing. See, I had been singing since I was two. As a matter of fact, my father says that I sang before I spoke. When I was two years old, I grabbed a belt and I started swinging it over my head and saying, you can ring my belt. 
ring my belt. When I was in middle school, I loved singing belting Whitney Houston songs up and down the halls. As a matter of fact, it landed me in detention a few times. The greatest love of all. In addition to singing, I also had this love for acting and storytelling. Now, you might not know that from my less than Oscar worthy performance when I was a tutor, but there was something about this idea of putting on another character that was really intriguing to me. I knew what I was going to do. I was going to go back to school in the fall, and I was going to delve headfirst into the performing arts program. Only when I got back to school, I learned that due to budget cuts, a lot of the performing arts programming had been cut. I was devastated because I was on this trajectory to find out who I was, and I was pretty sure I was a performing artist, but I wasn't going to have the opportunity to do that at my school. So, I set out to change that situation. I reached out to a group of acquaintances and I said, hey, um, there's no musical this year because it's been cut, but why don't we get together and put on our own show? And then we can take the proceeds from that show and raise money for the performing arts program. They said, that's great, that's a great idea, Janice, let's do it. There were 10 friends and we all came together and we're trying to figure it out and they said, but who's going to direct it? And, who's going to produce it, and who's going to do the music directing, and how are we going to have sets, and how are we going to have costumes. And the truth is, I hadn't thought of any of that. But in that moment, I said, we will. And they kind of all looked at me like it was crazy, because none of us had ever done any of that before. But my father always said, where there's a will, there's a way. So, first order of business is to decide what show we were going to do. We landed on the musical Godspell. There were 10 of us, and there are 10 people in that musical, and that's pretty much how we landed on that decision. <laughs> the second order of business is to figure out how we were going to raise money, because to put on a show, you have to have money. So we had to figure out how to raise money to then put on a show to raise money. So we had car washes garage sales, bottle drives. Now, I'm from Michigan, and in Michigan, for every plastic bottle or aluminum can, you get 10 cents if you take it back. So, we went on bottle drives, and what we found is that people not only gave us all of their bottles, they would then hand us a $10 bill or a $20 bill because they were so proud of what we were doing. Then, rehearsal time. Two, three, four hours a day. I, this is the first time that I put on my producer and director hat. I'm a director today. But at that time, I had never done it before. I put that hat on, and I worked so hard. But really, it was a collective effort. We worked so hard together. And in the end, we put on a phenomenal show. You see me right there in the front? Well, kind of, second row. Godspell was a huge hit. This picture came from the newspaper. And the newspaper also went on and on about how we came together and performed for a cause. We raised $5,000 for the performing arts program. But more importantly, the principal came to the production and saw the amount of community that had come out and all the engagement and he decided to reinstate all the performing arts programs that he had cut. This was amazing. This felt so good. And I, and I started to realize, as much as I loved performing, this idea of using my talent and my art to give to others had a lasting impact. The other thing that had a lasting impact on me is the community that was created. As you can see, this wasn't a group of black friends, this wasn't a group of white friends, it was actually a mixed bag. Black, white, Asian, Indian, Hispanic. We all came together and we worked together. 
We worked long hours. We got to know one another. We learned from each other and we learned each other. We weren't afraid to ask questions. We weren't afraid to have those difficult and sometimes uncomfortable conversations, the ones that are inevitable when you are truly asking people to bring their truest selves into a room. That had a huge impact on me because what I realized is that it really kind of changed my worldview. Whether we want to believe or recognize this, we all have a certain amount of implicit bias. We are conditioned that way. From the news, from the newspapers, from social media. We are conditioned to look at someone's outer appearance and make assumptions. But what I learned from this experience doing Godspell is that until you have these one-on-one -on -one conversations with people and really break down walls and break down stereotypes, it's hard to get rid of that bias. And I started thinking, what would happen if everyone were actively working or actively communing with people who were different than they and celebrating and accepting those differences? Maybe this world would be a much better place. In 2015, I had been working as a professional actor for about 10 years, and I was having a great time. I went to the University of Michigan and then went straight to New York City and started the actor life. And I was very fortunate. I wasn't one of these people who had to wait a lot of tables. I wasn't a starving actor. I kind of went from one show to the next show to the next, and I was touring the world and touring the USA and sitting down in houses and making really great connections with my theater family. It was wonderful. I had enthusiastic audiences every night, and definitely they, they left the theater different than how they came in, right? They were, they were joyous, or, or maybe the show was about some moral issue, and they left and they were thinking about it and talking with the people they came, so it was all good. But I felt an imbalance. When we did Godspell, it started with self. It started with, I need to figure out who I am. I'm an artist. I'm a performing artist. I'm going to go on a stage and sing. It's going to be great. But then it became about the community, building the community. Then, in addition to building the community, we took our art and helped others. The missing piece for me is that the shows that I was a part of, though they were great, they were either an all-black show, I was Dorothy and the Wiz, um, I was Charlene and Ape Misbehave, and great shows. Or it was a predominantly white show, and they put in a couple people of color in the name of diversity. You're in town, the musical on Broadway. I did that show with my husband. We were the two tokens in the cast. What was missing for me is that I felt like on stage needed to be a reflection of the people in the world that we live in. And more so, we needed to do more than just theater. We needed to be doing something to change the world. So in 2015, I co-founded Vanguard Theater Company. Our mission is summed up in one word, DREAM, which stands for diversity, reciprocity, education, awareness, and mentorship. We bring people together from lots of different backgrounds, different cultures, different religions, different zip codes, um, different um, ethnicities. And we just create art together. And something about being in a room with a bunch of people with this common focus of wanting to create art, walls are torn down. Stereotypes are torn down. I have a group of students who, in response to gun violence, decided they wanted to do something about it. And not only gun violence in schools, which I know is often um, popularized, 
but also gun violence in communities, which we don't hear about as much. They presented a concert called Sing for Our Lives, raising funds and awareness for gun violence. Shortly after that, um, this past fall, I directed a production of Runaways Off-Broadway. This is my cast. And they felt a heavy heart for homeless youth in this country. And they partnered with Covenant House, which is an organization that's really geared toward um, creating housing and opportunities for homeless youth. They raised $2,500 for that organization, and they built empathy with the community. As a matter of fact, the city of Montclair ended up deeming May 30th Homeless Awareness Day for teen youth because our kids did a sleep out and they slept out in solidarity with homeless youth in our country. That's the proclamation for May, March 30th, Homeless Awareness Day for teen youth in particular. Right now, in an off-Broadway theater, I have a cast performing the production of A Little Princess, which is all about classism and different cultures. They are currently in their third show. The whole production is sold out, but what's most important is that because this is based on a book, they have partnered with um, a charter school, and they have a book club with this charter school, and then they're taking the show on a mini tour to children's hospitals, uh, to an autistic enrichment center, and to assisted living facilities. Because that is the work that matters. The performing is great. I loved performing. I had a great time. But what has a lasting impact is the community that you build and the service that you give to others. I implore each and every one of you to really ask yourselves, what do I love? Once you figure out what that really is, Build a community of people who love that as well and step out of your comfort zone. Make sure that your group, your club, your organization um, looks like the makeup of the world that we live in. And take it a step further. Don't keep all that goodness for yourself. Serve others because we are our best selves when we give to others. Thank you.